G'day and welcome to episode 27 of The Other Side Australia, your weekly summary of the best news and views from a classical liberal perspective. I'm Damien Curry, the cranky man who thinks the country's going down the drain. This week we have on the show China, Meghan and Harry, Christian Porter, the always marching lefties this week disguised as feminists, Jordan Peterson and even Larry David. If you're new to the show, just a full proud disclosure, we are biased, biased towards traditional Western cultural values, institutions, classical liberalism, small business and free market economics. Free markets, free people, individual rights and liberty, all the horrible stuff. We are anti-left and anti-woke on this show, just so you know where we stand. We do not pretend to be neutral like some programs and networks do, and we don't cost you a cent. You only have to stay and watch our content if you choose to, and it's free. What do you got to lose? Let's go. With all the celebrity news and woke agonizing over gender equity this week, you may have missed some actually rather important news. The top US commander in the Indo-Pacific has warned that China is rapidly stepping up its efforts to supplant American military power in Asia. Hong Kong, and Xinjiang, and Tibet, and a line of actual control in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. I worry that they're accelerating their ambitions um, to be to supplant the United States um, and our leadership role in the rules-based international order, which they've long said that they want to do that by 2050. I'm worried about them moving that target closer. Taiwan is clearly um, one of their ambitions before that. And I think the threat is manifest during this decade, in fact, in the next six years. That was Admiral Philip Davidson, the head of U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, speaking in testimony this week before the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee. In the next six years, he thinks China will take action against Taiwan. For those of you who don't know, Taiwan is the island off the east coast of China, which claims to be an independent nation, but which China insists is part of China. Taiwan maintains its independence mainly because of US protection, a bit like us really. Otherwise, the commies would be all over the place like the now banned cartoon skunk Pepe Le Pew. Taiwan is rich, successful, and a capitalist democracy. Evil capitalism. All that poverty it alleviates. How terrible. China and Taiwan have been separately governed since the end of a civil war back in 1949. But Beijing, that's the mainland Chinese communists, have vowed to never let the island become officially independent. Admiral Davidson says, I cannot for the life of me understand some of the capabilities that China is putting in the field unless it's an aggressive posture. I see them developing systems, capabilities, and a posture that would indicate, indicate that they're interested in aggression. These may be the most important words spoken for our country's future, as well as Taiwan's, in quite some time. But anyway, how about that Meghan and Harry, eh? China has just announced a 6.8% increase in military spending for 2021. On the flip side, Taiwan's getting 66 new American F-16 fighter jets in the biggest arms sale to that country in years. Admiral David is particularly worried about China becoming more active around the US Pacific Island territories, like Guam, a US territory with 170,000 US citizens. Which brings me to the Quad, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, the strategic forum of the US, Japan, India and Australia. Something historic happened this week. The four leaders of those nations met virtually on Friday. Historic because it was the highest level meeting yet for the group. And Mr. Davison said he hoped the organisation could build into something bigger. As we begin a new day here in Australia, it's not yet dawn, but we join together as quad leaders of nations to welcome what I think will be a new dawn in the Indo-Pacific through our gathering. We are united by our democratic values and our commitment to a free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific. In July last year, Scott Morrison announced Australia's defence spending would increase to $270 billion over the next decade, with purchases of lots of new defence technologies. It will expand our plans to acquire sophisticated maritime long-range missiles, air-launched strike and anti-ship weapons, as well as additional land-based weapons. That's right. 
That's what we're going to do. We will also invest in more highly integrated and automated sensors and weapons, including potential development of hypersonic weapons systems. And this investment will see us build on Defence's collaboration with Australian industry, which is already at a new level. Meanwhile, Chinese leader Winnie the Pooh, oh, sorry, I mean Xi Jinping, called on his nation's armed forces to, quote, focus on combat readiness, unquote while setting out military goals for the next five years. So what did the US Department of Defense at the Pentagon think of the Admiral's comments? Here's President Biden's new Pentagon spokesman, John Kirby. Bipartisan across uh, decades in this country has there been uh, US support for making sure that Taiwan can defend itself. Uh, but nobody wants to see them have to actually do that. Nobody wants to see this come to blows. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important that we revitalize our alliances and partnerships in that region. And we make this trip and we make it clear that America takes seriously our security commitments. Uh, but, uh, you know, to his other point about uh, the speed with which China is developing these capabilities, we're certainly mindful of that. We would agree with uh, Admiral Davidson that they are moving at a clip uh, that is concerning. And that's why, again, uh, we want to make this trip and the secretary wants to be able to come back and, and make sure that we are developing the concepts and the policies, the strategies, as well as the capabilities uh, to meet that pacing challenge that, that they represent. One of the things, one of the first things that the secretary did when he took office was stand up a China task force, which is up and running here at the Pentagon to help us get our arms around and our brains around the, the challenge that China is is going to continue to pose. That's President Biden's new Defense Department spokesperson, John Kirby, speaking to CNN. The trip he's talking about is that of the new US Secretary of State, that's their equivalent of our Foreign Affairs Minister, Antony Blinken, and Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin. This week, they're visiting key allies, Japan and South Korea, for talks about managing those commie rascals, China and North Korea. When this trip ends, Blinken will meet his Chinese counterparts for talks in Alaska. And we'll keep you posted on how that goes. To the Women's March, which was really a left-wing pro-Labor anti-Liberal Party march, and for many of the women involved, an anti-men march. Yes, there were thousands who marched and there were millions who didn't. And no, you don't get to demand the Prime Minister comes out and meets with you to be attacked and abused in public just because you're having a march. You're lucky to have been invited to a private meeting. And the fact that you turned it down says it all, really. When you snub a meeting with our elected leader, you snub all of us and you prove that your motives are not genuine. A lot of male commentators have been tripping over themselves to be balanced and fair in their coverage of all of this, terrified of the mob and the bully power they wield on social media. Well, fellas, we need to man up a bit, I think. Our culture is in crisis, and we've let the Marxist myth of the patriarchy grow into a monster we now can't control. After all this, I still do not know what specifically this minority of women want. And yes, they are a minority. Even if the national number, number of 100,000 marches is true, that means 12.9 million couldn't be bothered or pretty much don't feel the pain of the sisterhood. So what do they want? Rape is already a Category 1 crime. Sexual assault is already a crime. Sexual harassment is totally taboo at work. Most HR departments are well-equipped to deal with it. The culture has shifted to the point where most men are terrified to even be alone with a female colleague. Are we there yet, Mum? If the next step is more regulation, more public education campaigns, or worst of all, the removal of the presumption of innocence for the accused, or the requirements of admissible evidence, then I'm sorry... But we're not going there as a society. We must never go there. And if you think I'm being sexist, ask yourself why you probably know that one woman dies in Australia from domestic violence every week, but not that one man does. They do. Why you know more about the lie that is the gender pay gap, yet maybe not about the truth of the suicide gap, or the life expectancy gap, or the military deaths gap, or the many other gaps that men could find and promote if we also wanted to play the Marxist game of accumulating victim points and blaming the other for all our woes. Not only do I not support those who marched yesterday, I find them reprehensible for their selective perception and intellectual laziness.
So they weren't really women's marches in the streets of our capital cities this week, of course. Just another iteration of the Marxist oppression lie. One day it's sexism, the next it's racism, the next it's the climate. But underneath, it's the same old mob. In Marxism, there has to be an oppressor and an oppressed. You get everyone sold on the narrative of being oppressed, get them real angry and focused only on that one thing, get them all ignoring the bounty they already have, all the good things that the system, like the free market and capitalism and small government has provided them with, and then propose your one big government as the answer to all their woes. And bam, you got control. They hijack every movement going. Women's issues, race issues, climate change, anything in the identities polit and identity politics mix. But why is Marxism so appealing and why is it endured despite resulting in the bloody murder of 100 million people by their own governments in the 20th century? You'd think we have, would have learned, right? I mean, that's a pretty big simulation to run. Well, it has to do with the psychology of envy and of wanting to be parented and the psychology of laziness. People get to lessen the burden of personal responsibility by blaming some sort of systemic oppression, real or imagined. It's also a cognitively simple answer. I don't have to think too hard or examine myself and my life and my behavior too much. And plus all these other cool people around me believe it, so it must be true, right? The absurd result? Tens of thousands of the most affluent and privileged women on the planet living in the freest, most blessed society in the history of the world, built upon capitalism and free market policies, significantly by men, marching in the streets to claim their beloved victimhood. The emotion I feel? Disgust. Is it any wonder we see a wealthy princess on TV complaining about how bad her life has been? No sense of service or sacrifice or giving back to the country or the world. Just me, me, me. Take, take, take. In this week's Liberalism Education segment, Jordan Peterson explains the enduring appeal of the madness of Marxism. Why is it, do you think that, uh, oh, here we go, that Marxism is such a rooted ideology compared to things like classical liberalism or all of these other ideologies that we see? Like, this thing's been around since the mid-1800s, and it's taken over almost everything, especially college campuses. Why do you think that is? Well, that's a good question. I mean, Thanks. I think the, the first communists, let's say, the Russians, let's say, for the sake of argument, they were much less reprehensible philosophically than today's Marxists. And the reason for that was, well, they had a utopian vision and not that that's necessarily a good thing, but they didn't necessarily know that it was a bad thing, right? And so, and the old aristocratic European structure was crumbling and there'd been a terrible war and, you know, the czarist regime was, well, compared to the communist regime, it was heaven on earth, but, you know, it had its problems. And so, there, and as, even as Nietzsche said, you know, that that communism would be worth it as an experiment. But he also said, and this was in Will to Power, that hundreds of millions of people would die as a consequence, which is one of the most remarkable prophecies, I think, that have ever been uttered by anyone ever. Okay, so it's attractive, it's utopian, but then there's the dark side of it, right? Which means everyone who has more than you got it by stealing it from you. And that it really appeals to the Cain-like element of the human spirit, right? Everyone who has more than me got it in a manner that was corrupt and that justifies not only my envy but my actions to to level the field so to speak you know and and to look virtuous while doing it and so there's there's a tremendous philosophy of resentment that i think is driven now also by a a, a very pathological anti-human ethos that, that you also see at the base of of much of the environmentalist movement. Like, it's not like we're not doing some stupid things to the planet, like what we're doing to the oceans, for example, is reprehensible beyond comprehension. But, you know, I've heard environmentalists state quite straightforwardly that human beings are a cancer on the planet. It's like, if someone says that to you, you know, you should move away from that person very, very quickly because that statement is genocidal in its, in its spiritual ori origin. And so I think there's a, there's, a, there's a whole 
cluster of unexamined motives of resentment that primarily drive the, the resurgence of the Marxism. But it's also a consequence of the poor, the, the biased education that, 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 that our, our children receive. You know, they know a bit about the Second World War and about the Nazis. But they don't know anything about what happened in the Soviet Union and China. Like often in universities, and I teach a personality course, it's like that's not where you should be learning about the six million Ukrainians who died of starvation in the 1930s. But most of my students have never heard of any of that. It's like, what the hell? We fought a whole Cold War about that. We damn near <laughs> annihilated the planet because of it. And all of a sudden it's, well, it's an inconvenient for the neo-Marxists to notice that that the regimes of, of Stalin and Mao were brutal beyond comprehension. So how about if we don't talk about it, you know? So there's lots of corruption that's driving this, but a huge part of it is resentment. And like, I think the worst emotions are resentment, the worst actions are resentment, deceit, and arrogance. And you get those three working together, boy, you got a force that you better be careful with. Do you think it's dying off? Or What's going that? away? Do you think Marxism is dying off or going away at all? Or do you think it's getting stronger? I think that what's happened is that it's, it's transmutated into this postmodernism and identity politics, which was really, really devious, really devious. Um, and that was a consequence of the French intellectuals, mostly uh, Derrida and Foucault. Um, but, but it's not going away. What's happened instead is that it's taken a new strategic tack and it's one that no one really envisioned. What it's doing is taking over the administration of mid-level bureaucracies everywhere. So it's not so much a threat at the highest level of political organization, but that isn't necessarily where much of the, the power over individuals resides. It resides in these smaller political uh, structures, sub-political structures, like, like school boards, for example, or or in Canada right now, our law society in Ontario has made it mandatory for lawyers to produce a statement of principles that they provide a template for. They tell you what your damn statement of principles should be. And they're basically equity, diversity, and inclusivity statements. And if you don't write out your statement of principles, de de declaiming your agreement with these uh, principles and simultaneously essentially admitting that you're a racist, then you don't get your license. So we're fighting a big war about that right now in Ontario. We might even win. It looks like we might win, you never know. But, but and it's also partly because ordinary people are too complacent about the mid-level bureaucrats who rule over them. You know, We're willing to allow those relatively small positions of power to be taken over by groups that are very good at doing that sort of thing. And, we need to wake up to that because it's seriously not good. And it's very difficult to fight back against. Great news this week that Christian Porter is going to stand up against the bullying mob and fight to clear his name. No kangaroo court parliamentary inquiry. This is going to be a civil defamation trial. Porter suing the ABC and pop author Louise Milligan for damaging his reputation and career. Porter's suit alleges that the February article revealing a historic rape allegation against an unnamed cabinet minister defamed him by portraying him as the perpetrator of a brutal rape of a 16-year-old girl when he was 17. Even though the article doesn't name him outright, it is defamation if it can be reasonably assumed that everybody knew who you were talking about. His name was trending on Twitter big time in the days before he outed himself on March the 3rd. So pass the popcorn. I'm so going to enjoy watching the ABC and Milligan defending themselves. Is it just me? Or are American talk show hosts and news comedians like Stephen Colbert just becoming less and less funny? They're all at a loss for something to make cheap shots about now that Donald Trump's out of office. Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Late Show. I'm your host, Stephen Colbert. I have a lovely, lovely sip of a... Mm. My coffee right here. Get all zipped up. There you go. Sound loves that, right? Doesn't the sound guys love that? Ha! <laughs> <laughs> ah, hilarious stuff. The zipper. That's, yeah, just, wow. I suppose it's better than the same Trump joke he's been telling for the last five years. 
Anyway, their witty, oh-so-cool gags, putting down conservatives and conservative values, making inner-city elites feel like they're still the cool smart kids, while insulting the other half of the country, are just getting tedious. There's no more arrogant lefty and less funny of the crew than John Oliver. This week, Oliver decided to go after Fox News host Tucker Carlson, the highest-rating TV show host in the US. Why? Well, the piece went on and on and on. So I think Oliver might have a bit of an obsession, but generally it was for being a conservative human with conservative values. In one part of the seemingly endless hatchet job, Oliver slammed Carlson for daring to speak out against US Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, a far left Democrat darling and one of AOC's gang of four. A woman who seems to hate everything about the United States and Western civilization that helped make her who she is today. As long as our economy and political systems prioritize profit without considering who is profiting, who is being shut out, we will perpetuate this inequality. So we cannot stop at criminal justice system. We must begin the work of dismantling the whole system of oppression wherever we find it. Wow, in under 30 seconds in that clip on Tucker Carlson's show, Ilhan Omar slams the profit motive, the very thing that makes capitalism and free market economies work so well and has lifted tens of millions of people out of poverty in the past 50 years. And she manages to weave in the classic Marxist rhetoric of bringing down the whole system of oppression. That's worthy of a bit of critique in my book. Tucker Carlson's reaction to Omar's comments back in 2020 is one that I couldn't agree with more. Dismantle the American economy and the American system of government, institutions that generations of Americans built over hundreds of years. Yep, sounds reasonable to me. Have some respect for the system and the people who came before you. But no, not according to John Oliver's British middle-class pseudo-socialist worldview. Here's his take on Tucker's criticism of Omar. All right. There is already enough there in the sneering condescension that Ilhan Omar should be quietly grateful her entire life because she was granted asylum when she was a child. Um, why would it be so hard to be grateful for your whole life for what a country that granted you and your family asylum did for you? Lots of immigrants are grateful when they move to a country with a freer, better system. My ancestors were. And they worked like dogs to give back. But how exactly is Omar oppressed by this system she so hates? It enabled her, an immigrant and a Muslim woman, to become a congresswoman. But that's just not okay in John Oliver's worldview. Let's just consider the vast distance between what you just heard her say and what he seemed to hear. Because according to Tucker, dismantling the system of oppression means dismantling the entire American economy and system of government. Right. So when she said she hates profit and wants to dismantle the system of oppression, we're supposed to believe that John Oliver, a British educated lefty, someone who would definitely have studied Marxism at university, didn't recognise any of that rhetoric as Marxist. And that Tucker Carlson is jumping to crazy right wing nut job conclusions. No, John, we know the game you're playing. Character assassination of a conservative right winger because you can't debate the issues themselves. Pathetic. There's one left-wing American talk show host left that I can still stand to watch, and that's Bill Maher. At least Maher is often very funny, and he's old-school left. He detests woke culture and identity politics, and the self-obsession of the modern Westerner. Have a listen to this from Maher's show this week, and maybe replace the word America for Australia. You're not going to win the battle for the 21st century if you are a silly people, and Americans are a silly people. That's the classic phrase from Lawrence of Arabia when Lawrence tells his Bedouin allies that as long as they stay a bunch of squabbling tribes, they will remain a silly people. Well, we're the silly people now. Do you know who doesn't care that there's a stereotype of a Chinese man in a Dr. Seuss book? China. All 1.4 billion of them could give a crouching tiger flying f because they're not a silly people. If anything, they are as serious as a prison fight. Look, we all know China does bad stuff. They break promises about Hong Kong autonomy. They put Uyghurs in camps and punish dissent, and we don't want to be that. But it's got to be something between authoritarian government that tells everyone what to do 
and a representative government that can't do anything at all. In two generations, China has built 500 entire cities from scratch, moved the majority of their huge population from poverty to the middle class, and mostly cornered the market in 5G and pharmaceuticals. Oh, and they bought Africa. <laughs> their new Silk Road initiative is the biggest infrastructure project in history, indebting not just that continent, but large parts of Asia, Europe, and the Middle East to the people who built their roads, bridges, and ports. In China alone, they have 40,000 kilometers of high-speed rail. America has none. <laughs> Our fastest train is the train that goes around the zoo. On a national level, we've been having Infrastructure Week every week since 2009, but we never do anything. Half the country is having a never-ending woke competition deciding whether Mr. Potato Head has a dick. And the other half believes we have to stop the lizard people because they're eating babies. We are a silly people. Even when we all agree on something, like getting rid of the penny. No, the inertia, the ass covering, the graft, the lawyers, the cowardice, nothing ever moves in this impacted colon of a country. We see a problem and we ignore it, lie about it, fight about it, endlessly litigate it, sunset clause it, kick it down the road, and then write a bill where a half-assed solution doesn't kick in for 10 years. China, see China sees a problem and they fix it. They build a dam. We debate what to rename it. That's why their airports look like this and ours look like this. In San Francisco, it took 10 years just to get two bus lines through environmental review. The Big Dig, a tunnel in Boston, took 16 years. China once put up a 57-story skyscraper in 19 days. They demolished and rebuilt the San Yuan Bridge in Beijing in 43 hours. We binge watch, they binge build. When COVID hit Wuhan, the city built a quarantine center with 4,000 rooms in 10 days, and they barely had to use it because they quickly arrested the spread of the disease. They were back to throwing raves in swimming pools while we were stuck at home surfing the dark web for black market Charmin. <laughs> we're not losing to China, we lost. The returns just haven't all come in yet. They made robots that check a kid's temperature and got their asses back in school. Most of our kids are still pretending to take Zoom classes while they watch TikTok and their brain cells slowly commit ritual suicide. <laughs> As George Bush once said, is our children learning? There's a progressive trend now to sacrifice merit for equity. Colleges are chucking the SAT and ACT test, and in New York, Mayor de Blasio announced merit would no longer decide who gets into the schools for advanced learners, but rather a lottery system. You think China's doing that, letting political correctness get in the way of nurturing their best and brightest? You think Chinese colleges are offering courses in the philosophy of Star Trek, the sociology of Seinfeld, and surviving the coming zombie apocalypse. Those are real, and so is China, and they are eating our lunch. There's still a few sane people on the left, and Bill Maher is one of them. I guess they'll cancel him soon. Speaking of stupid nations, Western Australia followed Queensland into Looney Land this week, returning a premier simply because he chants nice parochial slogans. Go WA. We'll show those dang Easterners who's boss. Yep, he cripples your state by shutting borders to win cheap political points and you reward him as we rewarded Anastasia in Queensland with an election win. But not just a win, a complete annihilation. It seems the people of WA are quite happy to give dictator Mark absolute power. No opposition in the lower house with the Liberal Party reduced to two or maybe three of the 59 lower house seats and the Nationals four. So they'll be the official opposition now for what it's worth. And in the upper house, you couldn't even vote to hold the cross benches. And at least force McGowan to do a little negotiating before ramming laws through for the next four years. Nope, he gets control of the Legislative Council too. Brilliant. Of course, the Liberal Party, the party that I must disclose I am a member of, 
is just as much to blame as anyone. Get woke, go broke, or in their case, completely disappear. The party organisation, which Liberal leader Zach Kirkup spent his entire concession speech talking about, here's a clue, Zach, nobody cares about the party politics and internal goings on. They obviously would have learned that a surefire way to lose an election is to have absolutely no differentiation from the ruling party and to offer no alternative on the major issue of the day. They might have learned that if there had been, say, an election in another state where that tactic was tried and failed. Oh, wait, there was one just four months ago in Queensland. And I thought the Queensland Liberal Party headquarters needed fresh talent. Can you imagine the meetings of the WA Liberal Party? Let's see, what strategy should we apply? Oh, I know. Let's use the one that just failed in Queensland. Oh, we'll double down on it. and We'll go even more left wing and woke. Hooray. Unbelievable. The future of our state depends on a strong Liberal Party in opposition or in government. And I want to make sure we do all we can to support those members that remain over the next four years because they're going to need us. There's only two of them left, Zach. It shouldn't be too hard to support two people. The blind spot is the size of a Mack truck with this guy. Honestly, too many years in politics and not enough in the real world. I think Sky News commentator James Morrow had the best commentary this week on the failings of WA and Zach. He decided to go and run and fight from the left. So, you know, we had David Honey, the energy guy from the opposition on the other week, and he couldn't answer any of the questions that uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, why they were going to net zero in a mining state. Um, again, they played to the insularity of WA and, you know, backed in just as the opposition did in Queensland, and they lost two uh, on border closures, which, of course, has been devastating to economies across the country. Um, They haven't done anything to distinguish themselves as a centre-right party, which is, of course, what they need to do. My heart actually bleeds for all the candidates who lost and all the hardworking volunteers who do give a damn about the fact that WA is being run with very little focus on liberty or sensible support for small business and the jobs it creates. My liberal friends, you're never going to win an election until we change the culture of the nation. Politics is downstream of culture. Until we call out the manipulation tactics of politicians like McGowan, Palaszczuk and Andrews, who play on people's fears and lack of understanding of economics, who buy votes by spending like a Kardashian with a platinum credit card, racking up debt, and chant parochial state of origin sports style slogans in political debates just to win popularity, the market research will always tell you that the electorate wants more left-wing policies and lockdowns to keep them safe. Because nobody is giving people any alternative. Except Gladys. You could have copied Gladys since she won her election instead of copying the mob in Queensland who lost. You'd have to start to lead, of course, not just follow. Paint a picture, sell a vision, excite and motivate. And if you can't do it, get the heck out of the way so that people who want to have a crack and serve their country get the opportunity to do so. It's time for Liberal Party grassroots members in branches across Queensland and WA to do some turfing of the seat-warming career MPs and the failed state party execs who've been around long past their use-by date. It's fresh blood time, and the change can only start with the grassroots members. It's no good sitting around watching shows like this and getting mad at the woke kids and the destruction of our economy and entire value system. Join your party. Go to meetings, vote for talented people with proven CVs and life experience for a change and help make the change happen. By the way, thousands of Aussie families who want to return to Australia remain stranded overseas as our government continues the unprecedented, very unliberal policy of limiting citizens' right to return to their home country. It's unbelievable, really. It's okay to require people to quarantine, make them pay for it themselves if you must. But locking people out of their own country? No right whatsoever to do that, my friends. Ever. Not even for a pandemic. Sorry. And if you think that's bad, you still can't leave our country without government permission. You can't leave of your own free will. Now, what on earth is that about? What about the hundreds of thousands of Aussies with close relatives overseas they need to go see? It's a total nanny state with a pseudo-liberal government. As well as the Aussies who 
do want to move back home. Thousands more Aussie families don't want to live back here, but they have lives overseas and they do need to come back and see their families, attend weddings and funerals, deal with important business issues. How long can these restrictions go on before we say, okay, we're now just going to have to learn to live with this thing? Sadly, it looks like the AstraZeneca vaccine is causing some problems. Germany, Italy, France, Portugal and Spain have all suspended the rollout because of blood clot concerns. At the time of recording our show this week, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg was standing by Australia's rollout of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Even as his coalition colleague, Nationals MP Matt Carnarvon, calls for a halt. While the anti-vaxxers will be weirdly celebrating the joys of being right, no doubt, the rest of us are quite disappointed this amazing new mRNA technology is having these teething problems. Hopefully, they will sort it out. Meantime, in Hong Kong, where lots of Aussies live and work, more than in Townsville, I think, there's been a spike in the number of cases, up to 30. Schools have been closing, a new lockdown is in force, and the US consulate and a dozen or so other buildings have been ordered closed. Nearly 120 children and teens are currently confined in Hong Kong's COVID-19 quarantine camps out near the Disneyland site. But it's no amusement park. The kids can have one parent stay with them, but they're not allowed to leave their tiny Donga-style rooms for two weeks. Some expatriate parents are angry about the policy after their children were deemed close contacts of a confirmed case at a school and ordered to quarantine including an entire class of eight-year-olds from the main British International School in Hong Kong. That decision was later reversed, thankfully. I wanted to make the other side Australia a Meghan and Harry free zone, but it's absolutely impossible. (laughs) This is my favourite meme on the whole matter, which I think sums it up beautifully. If you do want to check out my thoughts on the interview from a PR guy perspective, you can take a look at episode four of this season of The People's Project with Josh and Matt, another great show on the discernible platform. Here's a little bit of that chat with the boys last week. Her value system is not going to be able to, I don't believe, understand the value system of the royal family. And that's where I think... Hen- um, Okay. Harry needed Harry to step up. up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And he hasn't. And I think if you the comparison really is Mary of Denmark. I mean, if you look at how Mary as an Australian went into that environment and she was hammered by the Danish press initially with skepticism because, you know, who's this foreigner coming in and marrying our guy? Um, so what did she do? She knuckled down, humbly knuckled down and learned a very complicated language mm. late in life and studied like a, like a dog, that, the history of the country, the language of the country. She accepted and bought into that role. And you could argue that Megan being a, an actress should, be, should have been able to recognise that and do that as well. Um, she wanted to play the role, but she wanted to play it on her terms mm. and, not, and without sort of respect for that history. And I think that's another characteristic of the millennial generation, not to to bucket them too much more, but but really um, it is pretty dominant in the millennial generation that there's this kind of disrespect and disregard for history as if everybody in history was some evil, you know, v- racist, sexist villain and everybody, and, and there, were no, there was no virtue in history. And so there's nothing in this institution that's been going for thousands of years that's worth looking at or examining or respecting. So I'm just gonna come in with my American values and tell you how it should be folks. Mm. Um, and I think that showed pretty early. I mean, she was embraced very positively by the press. Piers Morgan made this point the other day that she was, you know, showed a bunch of newspaper front pages of when they were first got together and how positive the coverage was. And she did very well on the trip to Australia and all of that stuff. And they loved her. And, you know, maybe she claims that people wanted to bring her down after that because she was doing too well. Um, Every royal goes through a cycle of getting bashed by the press. That's how yep. it works. It's Kate like did a as positive well. cycle, then a negative. And you just ride it out. You know, you yep. just go, okay, I need to readjust. I need to do some signals now that are very uh, humble, uh, very respectful, uh, very virtuous, very, uh, you know, in the truth, in the d- deeper sense. Go out and do that for a couple of months. Do a Diana um, and, and win them back, right? Mm. If you're such a, a superstar. And it won't take that long. Um, before it'll turn again. 
because that's what that's how, think, the, that's how public opinion is it's irrational and, and childish it just follows you know you're a bad guy one day you're a good guy the next you're a bad guy the next day you're a good guy the next day yeah and i think but again harry should have taught us yeah exactly i think what we're looking at is the the effects of not being able to have a clear personal identity of who you are but you have to import that from a culture or some sort of uh, philosophy like wokeness or something like that. Um, but you also see the difference that character makes, personal character, in um, facing out-of-the-norm situations. Damien, I was actually uh, Gen Y millennial here who's the opposite of what you've just described. I was not popular amongst my family when um, Meghan Markle was getting married, the big royal wedding, and I was disgusted with the wedding. And I said so publicly that this isn't the way she was trashing institutions and everyone was doing their clap, clap, look at you breaking all the rules. And I could see from then, hey, this girl is... She's causing trouble. She's anti this whole conservative movement. So I think there are some millennials like myself who want to see that um, those old things oh, conserved. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's not. It's not. I'm not even sure that the millennial ideology that dominates is actually the dominant millennial ideology. By the way, I'm not sure that hmm. that millennials are as woke as the woke millennials would have us believe because they're so loud. That is a very good point. Season three, episode four of the People's Project. Up now on the discernible and good source platforms. Comedy time now. And there was a very funny scene in the comedy show Curb Your Enthusiasm by Larry David, the Seinfeld creator, in which Larry, in his typical insensitive style, asks a biracial couple how dark skinned each of them would prefer the child to be. It's not a biracial couple who hasn't been through this sort of thing on some level, believe me. Somebody clever took that scene and in one of the best memes I've ever seen on the whole thing, they cut it up with the Meghan and Harry interview. Check this out. Who is having that conversation with you? Have you thought about the, uh, the skin color at all? You know, the tone, would you prefer it's, it's, a, it's a little darker? I would imagine you might prefer it to be a little darker as opposed to lighter, no? No. Ah. You'd probably um, like it a little lighter, maybe. No, I don't, I'm not comfortable sharing that. Okay. Um, but Say somebody put a gun to your head. Said, do, do you want your baby to be lighter or darker? What would you choose? Do you want a lighter or a darker baby? What shade? What shade? Hold up, hold up. There's Stop several right comments. There are several conversations. There's a about conversation it. with you about how dark your baby is going to be? Yeah, that makes sense. Ooh. What? The Australian of the Year, in my opinion, is this bloke, former Federal Finance Minister Matthias Cormann who this week landed the gig as the head of the big global body, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. But what is the OECD? It's an international organisation made up of 37 member countries, including 26 of the EU states, as well as Australia, New Zealand, the US, Canada, the UK, Mexico, Israel, South Korea, Colombia, Chile and Turkey. I do like Chile with my turkey. Sorry. But how was the OECD formed and why? Please tell us in under 60 seconds, nice internet lady with the slow voice. In 1948, the Organisation for Economic European Cooperation, OEEC, was founded in order to implement the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan was an aid program initiated by the United States of America. The aim of the plan was to help rebuild the economies of Western European countries following the end of the Second World War. The plan was also created in part to help prevent the spread of communism in Europe. The OEEC was renamed OECD in 1961. It continued to focus on stimulating economic progress and facilitating world trade. The OECD also began to accept non-European states as members. In 1989, the OECD began to help countries in Central and Eastern Europe to prepare for major market economy reforms 
after the collapse of communist rule. Matthias Cormann is not only the first Australian OECD Secretary General, but the first from the Asia-Pacific region. It's important to celebrate our wins, Australia. It's also important to mourn our losses, and this week we lost one of the vocal greats of the 70s, Doug Parkinson. I had the pleasure of seeing Doug play Judas in my favourite musical, Jesus Christ Superstar, back in the 80s. Great voice. We'll let Doug take us out today with this classic from Countdown's Vault back in 1981. We'll see you next week, and don't forget to subscribe on all platforms and tell your friends to help us grow. Stay free, and don't let the woke kids get you down. 